thank you uh, for uh, joining us and uh, taking time out to give us this talk um, and showing us all the cases. So if I can just introduce Dr. Uh, Ashish Chandra. He's working at uh, Guys and Thomas, St. Thomas's Hospital NHS Trust in London, UK. He's a lead consultant cytopathologist and uropathologist. He's the chairman of British Association of Urological Pathologists. And uh, he's also the vice president of International Academy of Cytology. And he has a special interest in reporting terminologies and clinical guidelines. And uh, he has also uh, been awarded Maurice Goldblatt International Services to Cytopathology. So um, it's our pleasure and uh, to welcome Dr. Ashish Chandra. It's over to you, Dr. Chandra. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and the warm welcome. It is uh, uh, my loss entirely that I'm not uh, be able to present in person there with you in Lahore. Uh, but many, many thanks to uh, to Dr. Mudassar Hussain and Dr. Uh, Asif Loya for the kind invitation and for organizing such a wonderful and successfully running conference. And uh, I can see social media is already sort of... Uh, uh, buzzing with with the success uh, of this meeting. So uh, congratulations to the organizers and thank you to all the attendees. So um, I think you have to put up with me for about uh, an hour and a half or a little bit longer. And I will try and cover a talk and then some scanned slide cases uh, on serous fluid cytopathology. So I'm going to try and share my screen now. Um, and on my desktop on the Zoom, I'm looking for, oh, let's, here we go, share screen. So I'll start with the presentation and slideshow, play from start. So we have a slightly rough voice. I lost my voice completely this week, so uh, it's been a tough week just trying to uh, get through the daily work so I hope you'll be able to hear me and understand me so thank you very much for this and this is guys in St. Thomas's um, hospital and uh, I have a lovely view from my office just in these trees here of uh, the um, of Westminster Palace the Houses of Parliament and the Big Ben and yes, uh, we have a few nice days in London as well with <laughs> relatively clear blue skies and no rain. Uh, however, today it's quite a cloudy day, so I'm glad to be here indoors and talking to you. Um, so without any further ado, let me introduce you to, if you aren't familiar with, uh, the International System for Reporting Serious Fluid Cytopathology. Um, and then just taking a step back, I'm sure in the course of this meeting over the last uh, couple of days, you've uh, already heard about the importance of standardizing terminology, not just in cytopathology, but uh, actually this exists across the board in histopathology, uh, in radiology, and in medicine as well. And to ensure good communication between pathologists and clinicians and clinicians and patients. It also allows us to compare data and to share knowledge, uh, including important facts like the risk of malignancy for different diagnostic categories and to form an evidence base for making clinical recommendations and guidelines. Uh, the slightly annoying fact about terminologies is that multiple terminology systems can exist for the same specimen, uh, you know, from the same organ, the same disease, and then we are left kind of puzzled, you know, which one do I use? Do I use the one that my uh, department or my institution uses? Do I use the one that's recommended by my national cytology? Do I just go for the uh, international cytology? And to make that decision, really, you have to be the judge in comparing and contrasting these existing systems and saying, are they all saying the same thing? How similar are they? What are the differences? Which one of these is actually keeping up? with science and literature and with, with the developments in, in that particular field? Is the data being validated? Is it updated? And is, is it based on emerging evidence? So, you know, all classification systems, all terminologies are 
fluid. So this is the International System for Serious Fluid Cytopathology, the book that was uh, uh, published uh, uh, two years ago, at the end of 2020, actually. Um, and now we're already thinking about uh, the next edition uh, based on uh, the interest and enthusiasm it has invoked in the readers and the new questions that have emerged as a result of um, you know, putting uh, this work together. So let us look at um, uh, you know, why this terminology system was devised in the first place. And it was, I have to say, certainly for me, uh, encouraged and inspired by the Paris system, which had already evaluated uh, adequacy in terms of the volume of the sample and cellularity of urine samples, which is what you've heard about this morning. And this in turn allows you to define what a true negative sample is. That is to say, when you say to a patient, you know, your sample is negative, and that means that you are free of disease. That is what a true negative sample uh, in cytology means. And we wanted to define this uh, better for serious fluids because not all of these patients will go on to have a histological confirmation of, of the diagnosis. We then also wanted to address the use of terminology like suspicious and atypia, recognizing that there's quite a lot of overlap in their usage. And we just wanted to uh, refine the criteria to reduce this degree of overlap uh, so that we would be able to uh, maybe recommend the risk of malignancy and what kind of entities might fall into which each, each of these categories. And then, of course, we wanted to revisit the whole uh, value and the view of uh, reporting and confidently diagnosing mesothelioma based on cytological samples alone. It still remains good practice and the gold standard to make the diagnosis of mesothelioma based on pleural biopsy through the demonstration of uh, subpleural fat invasion. However, given that the diagnosis and the definition of mesothelioma is now so much based uh, on ancillary testing, uh, that it is almost easier to make the diagnosis based on a cytology sample because all of these ancillary techniques can be applied uh, very easily indeed to a cytological specimen. And last but not the least, peritoneal washings. These can be very challenging specimens to report, uh, particularly when you see bland epithelial cells uh, in, uh, in, in, in these specimens and you know, are these normal, are these uh, uh, neoplastic, and if they're neoplastic, are they benign or borderline or malignant? All of those are challenging questions, uh, not just for histopathology, but even more so in cytopathology. So uh, just looking at, you know, the evidence that has uh, been coming forward uh, in the last couple of years that the uh, terminology system has been published, you'll see there's been you know, cytohistological correlations of pleural fluid, uh, lots of studies that have looked at these, uh, you know, studies that have looked at the risk of malignancy and diagnostic accuracy, and, uh, you know, suggesting and raising important questions about the different kind and of, of uh, a case mix that you might have in a community hospital setting compared to perhaps a cancer center or a big academic center. So all of these uh, questions have been raised in uh, the last couple of years. I think I might actually switch off my video so that uh, there is no interference with the sound, which is much more important. Okay, that's hopefully you'll be able to hear me more clearly, which is the important thing. So in a, uh, in a nutshell, this is what the international system looks like. It is really no different to many of the other systems in cytology terminology that you have uh, heard about yesterday and today. So there is the non-diagnostic category, there is negative for malignancy, there's a tipia of undetermined significance, suspicious for malignancy, and then the malignant category, which is split into primary, which uh, mainly, of course, covers mesothelioma, 
and then secondary, which covers both metastatic carcinomas, but also secondary involvement of the body cavities by leukemias and lymphomas, and which is why we went uh, for using malignant secondary rather than malignant metastatic uh, in order to include leukemias and lymphomas. So what are the factors involved in the adequacy of serous fluids? First of all, of course, is sample volume. And the big question to our clinicians and nurses who you know, might phone up the lab to ask, well, how much sample do you want? Uh, and thanks to the studies coming from uh, Professor Sayyad Ali's institution, uh, Johns Hopkins and Dr. Um, Elisa Rupert et al., uh, you know, through looking at thousands of specimens, uh, came up with the evidence base that 75 mil was an optimal volume for pleural and acidic fluids, and perhaps 60 mil was adequate for pericardial fluid. This was based on large numbers of studies and has been um, uh, validated subsequently uh, by using large numbers of specimens. Now, that's not to say that samples that we receive, which are only you know five or ten mil. Uh, should be rejected and not processed. We're not suggesting that. We're saying that the optimal volume that we should recommend to our clinical users is, you know, 75 mil or 60 mil uh, for pericardial fluids. But we should, of course, process whatever sample we receive. The other important piece of advice for uh, clinicians is that they should split up the sample uh, because they need to send portions of the sample to and microbiology and to biochemistry and to cytology. And they shouldn't just send the whole sample off to micro and say, oh, well, can you send over whatever whatever is left to you know cytology or biochemistry? That way everybody loses out, and especially the patient, because the sample deteriorates during its journey through all of these departments. And if we receive samples secondhand or thirdhand, um, uh, either in cytology or in biochemistry or in microbiology, the results of the test suffer, the quality is compromised, and you don't get the uh, correct result. So we want the sample to be adequate, but also be transported directly and swiftly to the lab where we want to send it. The second factor associated with adequacy is cellular content. And the question here to answer was, do you have to see mesothelial cells in an effusion sample? The short answer to that is no, you don't have to. It's nice if you do see them, but it is completely acceptable to find, say, just lymphocytes in a lymphocytic effusion due to you know, tuberculosis or a chylus effusion or only neutrophils in empyema. And you can have uh, you know, benign effusions without mesothelial cells. And the converse is also true. You could have a malignant effusion, which is just made up of a one cell population uh, of malignant cells and lacks mesothelial cells completely. So the short answer is that you don't have to have mesothelial cells uh, for adequacy of the sample. And then last but not the least, cellular preservation. And this to my mind is probably more important than the sample volume and the cellular content, because as we know, you could have a really good uh, cellular specimen, say an FNA specimen, uh, in which there is a lot of material, but because it is spread poorly and unevenly on the slide, you can't actually read the slide because all the cells are on top of each other. You can't appreciate the nuclei or they are covered with blood and exudate, and it limits the, uh, the quality of the sample when it comes to interpretation. And the same is true for serous fluid samples. And as I said, the loss of quality could be uh, due to degenerative changes that occur because of the delay in transporting this specimen to the laboratory, which encourages bacterial overgrowth, uh, particularly during the warm months of the year, and of course, uh, may induce uh, technical artifacts and contaminants. So cellular preservation is also very, very important. And again, there is a whole sort of wealth of uh, re recently published literature now looking at, and we'll hear more about this later this afternoon, about the impact of uh, using cell blocks in serous fluid cytology specimens, uh, and also some other studies that have actually tested uh, the recommendations that have been made. And I think that is part of an important work that all of you can do, is to audit your own practice and to see uh, whether it is in tune 
with the recommendations that are made in uh, terminology systems or whether your results are at variance with, uh, with them and what the reasons for uh, those differences might be. So, you know, the volume of the sample, for instance, has been challenged by many studies uh, to say, well, you know, we can actually get very good results even with smaller samples. And that is absolutely true. The 75 mil volume is the optimal sample. It's not to say that anything less than that would be non-diagnostic. So um, we can have a discussion about this uh, a bit later on today. So what I aim to do is to familiarize you with the reporting system uh, through six cases. And uh, then I will take some questions at the end of this talk. And then we'll look at some scanned slide seminar cases uh, uh, after the presentation. So let me start with my first case, which is that of a 54-year-old male with a left-sided pleural effusion. Uh, he's a smoker with a cough and chest pain for one week. Macroscopically, we received two mil of heavily blood-stained fluid from which one thin prep and one diff-quick cytospin was prepared. So I will take a moment to talk about the importance of looking at the macroscopic findings. Um, you know, it's really tempting when you get the case, you look at the clinical history and you put the slide under the microscope. For serious fluids, really just turn the page over and see what your cytotechnologist colleagues have recorded there in terms of the volume of the specimen and also what the specimen macroscopically looks like. Is it straw colored, which means it could probably be a transidate from a benign effusion, or whether it is pyrulent, which means it could be from an empyema resulting from an infectious condition, or it could be chylus uh, representing, you know, maybe lymphatic fluid um, uh, drainage into the pleural cavity. Um, and so on. So it's really important to be to pay attention to the macroscopic findings. And the second point I want to make here is about the type of preparations recommended for serous fluid samples, which is a combination of a PAP and a GIMSA. And the PAP could be either a thin prep or a show PAP liquid-based preparation, or it could be a cytospin, or it could be a direct spread uh, from a cytocentrifuged cell deposit and just spread like um, an FNA smear. Uh, and the Gimza or the Romanovsky dye-based uh, preparation could be um, an uh, MGG or a May Grunwald Gimza, or it could be a Diffquake, or it could be Heap Chemicolor. It doesn't matter. Uh, but, you know, a combination of a PAP and a Romanovsky stain uh, just gives you that additional information that you need, I would say, for FNA samples just as much as for serous fluid samples. And for this purposes, we um, wrote a document uh, for the RC path, which is there on the website, and the Tissue Pathways for Diagnostic Cytopathology, where we recommend that serous fluids should have one fixed slide prepared for a PAP stain and an air drive for a Romnovsky. If there is a clot present visible, in the specimen, the lab should just automatically process it. They don't need to have an instruction from the pathologist. If the pathologist feels after looking at the routine preparations that they need uh, you know, immunostains, they could then request a cell block. And of course, you know, you'll hear about the different types of preparations that you can use for a cell block. We still tend to use a, um, a thrombin uh, induced clot and then a paraffin embedded formalin fixed um, cell block, because that's how all our immunostains and molecular testing are validated in, in, the, uh, uh, in the immuno lab. Uh, there are also guidelines for sample preparation and staining at other sites. And again, for urine samples, only a PAP uh, is uh, adequate. There's no need to do a GIMSA. And also for bronchial and biliary uh, washings and brushings, a PAP alone is enough. There's no need for a GIMSA. But for all others, really, uh, the recommendation is to use a combination. So you don't even need to put this slide under the microscope to know that all you have here is a ring of lysed red blood cells. And, you know, this, uh, the film has literally peeled off in the center because it's just made up of blood only. And we look down the microscope at that peripheral rim and we see these um, lysed red blood cells and there are no mesothelial cells, no other cells to indicate that uh, there is any sampling of the 
uh, pleural cavity. On the Ginza, again, all you're seeing are some degenerate red and white blood cells. An important point here to make is that, you know, you probably should not refer to the blood elements as uh, inflammatory cells, because that suggests to the clinician that you are diagnosing an inflammatory condition, whereas all you're saying is this is just blood and blood neutrophils and blood lymphocytes. And uh, so just saying, you know, that uh, the sample consists of blood only is probably uh, adequate rather than saying there are red blood cells and neutrophils and lymphocytes, which sounds like you're describing an acute and chronic inflammatory um, exudate. So what should a sample report for a serous fluid sample look like? So there needs to be an adequacy statement, a diagnostic category, and in selected cases, perhaps a clinical comment. So um, for this particular case, it would be reasonable to say that the evaluation is limited by heavy blood staining and the sample is largely non-representative and therefore it falls in the non-diagnostic category. And I would, in the comment section, actually put down 75 mil volume if possible, because if you keep putting this down in your reports, eventually you're conveying the message to your clinicians uh, that this is the optimal volume that they should try and set. Uh, for cytology. So, you know, by incorporating this information in your reports, you are also continuing to uh, educate your uh, clinical colleagues about a relatively recent um, a terminology system with its uh, recommendations and guidelines. Okay. So let's move on to the second case, which is that of a 64-year-old male with liver cirrhosis and ascites. And macroscopically, 60 ml of straw colored fluid was sent. And as per usual, a PAP and Giemser preparations were examined. So um, in our laboratory, we tend to use cytospins for uh, serous fluids, but um, we also receive a lot of specimens for second opinions and uh, for multidisciplinary meeting review from other institutions. And so um, you have to be used to looking at you know, uh, the different types of preparations that might be used, which could be liquid-based preparations or direct spreads and cell blocks uh, prepared by different methods. And so here is the cytospin um, diff quick preparation of this fluid from a cirrhotic patient. And what you have here are mesothelial cells, uh, which are characterized by this uh, basophilic cytoplasm with a two-tone pattern of staining within the cytoplasm there are gaps or windows between these mesothelial cells. There is peripheral uh, lacy or skirt-like blebbing of the peripheral cytoplasm. There may be submembranous glycogen vacuoles. The nuclei look very uniform, almost similar size. Some cells might be binucleated or even multinucleated, but overall, the nuclei really resemble each other. The NC ratio is typically not high, it is low, and the nucleus is usually centrally situated um, with um, maybe a small nucleolus or even multiple nucleoli. Uh, but more importantly here, there is definitely uh, an inflammatory infiltrate, which is interacting with these mesothelial cell groups. It's infiltrating into them. You can see these neutrophils and lymphocytes blending in with those mesothelial cells. Here on the pap stain, you can appreciate the nuclear characteristics much better. A nice, smooth, round, regular nuclear membrane, finely dispersed chromatin with multiple small nucleoli. And these are features of inflammatory and reactive changes virtually at any organ site, any cell type. The presence of a single small large nucleolus is usually a warning sign for malignancy, but the presence of multiple small nucleoli which are situated close to the nuclear membrane um, and associated with a finely dispersed chromatin pattern usually indicate a reactive process. So in this case, again, you would uh, uh, write a report saying the sample is satisfactory for evaluation. You see neutrophils, mesothelial cells, and a few lymphocytes, and the sample is negative for malignancy. And the relatively high proportion of neutrophils that are present may represent uh, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis in a patient of cirrhosis, but this requires uh, correlation with the clinical findings and, of course, microbiology. 
So the negative for malignancy category is characterized by the presence of the normal or the expected cell population in variable numbers. So you could have, you know, lymphocytes, macrophages, mesothelial cells, neutrophils, and eosinophils. But depending on the predominance of uh, any of these cell types, you might be able to suggest a cause or an etiology for the effusion. So if you've got a predominantly eosinophilic effusion, it could, uh, of course, most commonly, it means that this is probably not the first time that this uh, um, a pleural fluid has been tapped. Perhaps there's been a recent or previous pleural aspiration, which allows for the introduction of air into the pleural or even the peritoneal cavity, uh, which then incites an eosinophilic reaction. Um, but if you're seeing sort of 80, 90% eosinophils and with no history of a previous uh, pleural fluid or acidic fluid aspiration, then of course you've got to raise the question of allergic conditions such as the hyper eosinophilic syndrome, parasitic infestations, etc. And likewise, for lymphocytic effusions, um, these may be associated with viral infections or TB, and it may be prudent to send part of the sample off to microbiology for, say, um, TB culture and detection of uh, mycobacteria. If there is a neutrophilic effusion or an empyema, this is usually indicative of a bacterial infection. But occasionally, it may also be malignant. So, and this is typically seen when a lung squamous cell carcinoma just ruptures into the pleural cavity. Okay, so moving on to my third case of uh, six. This is a 46-year-old female with a history of breast carcinoma six years ago and now presents with cough and a small pleural effusion. Macroscopically, we've only received 20 ml of straw-colored fluid from which a pair of PAP and GIMSA uh, have been prepared. And so here we have, this is at uh, times uh, 20 magnification, GIMSA preparation. And here again, you can see the basophilic cytoplasm of the mesothelial cells, the gaps or windows in between uh, these individual mesothelial cells. Um, but then you're also seeing this sort of microvacuation in this group of cells here. And by association, uh, these cells are probably mesothelial because they're part of the same larger family of mesothelial cells that they're all part of the same sheet of cells. But these cells here show uh, slightly different appearances of the cytoplasm, though not of the nucleus. Um, and in the background, you can see quite a lot of eosinophils. So presumably, um, you know, this is maybe not the first aspirate, it might be the second. And then there are also these microvacuations present both um, in the cytoplasm and probably also superimposed upon the nucleus. On the um, PAP preparation, again, what you see is some fibrin uh, in the background, and then you see uh, these cells, which probably correspond to the ones that you saw in the gamma. And again, you think these are probably mesothelial cells, but, you know, some of these do have prominent nucleoli. Um, and, uh, you know, the question in your mind is, can you confidently sign this out as negative just based on the morphology? Or in the light of the history of the breast carcinoma, should you be doing more? And so these are the sort of cases where, you know, you know that the uh, cells that you are looking at probably uh, only represent degenerate macrophages or mesothelial cells. But, you know, some of them might show a little bit of nuclear enlargement or even slightly darker staining chromatin in the absence of obvious chromatin and nuclear membrane abnormalities. So you're favoring these being likely degenerate macrophages is the mesothelial cells, but you want to cell block and immunostains to exclude the possibility of malignancy and confirming uh, that these are indeed mesothelial in origin. And once you've done that, then you feel confident that you can report the sample as negative malignancy because the epithelial markers are negative. So there may be a brief moment of concern based on the morphology and because of the degenerative changes, but it can be put to rest once you have done uh, just a small panel of immunostains. So this is the cell block, which again is showing a population on the HNA stain of um, mainly mesothelial cells, 
fibrin and scattered lymphocytes and perhaps some macrophages and your epithelial um, markers, uh, BRI P4, MOC31, uh, GATA3, whichever ones you've used in this particular case, are all negative. So the atypical category, as you've probably already heard in, you know, in head and neck and in urine, is a bit of a nuisance. You know, we all sort of struggle with it. Uh, luckily, in the setting of serious effusions, it's a very uncommonly used diagnostic category. And in fact, some experienced cytopathologists don't use it at all in the context of serious effusions. And the big question for us at the start of the project was, can we create a terminology system that is atypia free? Can we do without the atyp atypical category completely? However, before we started the project, we had sent out a survey and then we got about 600 responses back from across the world. And we asked them the question, you know, should we just combine the atypical and suspicious categories for serous fluids and just do away with this um, split? But the survey respondents uh, said to us that they use atypia and suspicious in slightly different contexts. Uh, and there is some variability in the way they use it. And they uh, agreed that maybe this is a two-step thought process where you have a preliminary idea of what you think it might be. And at that point, you can issue a report. It's optional, depending on how long it takes for your um, immunostains to come back. If they come back in a day or two, then you can just wait. But if it's going to take longer than that, then you could issue a preliminary report to say, you know, there's a few atypical cells present and I'm doing immunostains to exclude the possibility of malignancy. And once you get those immunostains back, you can then issue a final report saying the immunostains are negative and the sample is negative for malignancy. And so we agreed to keep the atypical category in, but we uh, promised ourselves that we would try and make a distinction between the, uh, atypia and suspicious. And this was the algorithm um, that I developed for the atypical category um, in serous effusions. But since then, I've actually also applied this to the WHO lung cytopathology system. And I think um, philosophically, it probably uh, really applies to the atypical and suspicious categories across any terminology systems. So the quandary or the puzzle there is that you've got small numbers of cells uh, the nature of which you are uncertain, but you favor macrophages or mesothelial cells over epithelial cells. So your preliminary assessment or evaluation is, there's a few atypical cells present. And then if the immunochemistry demonstrates atypical cells to be macrophages or mesothelial cells, then you report it out as negative for malignancy. And this will take care of the vast majority, you know, the 80% of cases which turn out to be negative when you do your immunostains. However, there'll be a small proportion of cases where, you know, uh, the immunostains, in fact, surprises you by demonstrating those epithelial cells, uh, those atypical cells to be epithelial. And that can happen with the very bland looking malignancies like breast carcinoma. Uh, and for these cases, then you could upgrade your final report to either suspicious and ask for a repeat sample or a confident definite malignant uh, secondary. And then you will be left with only a handful of cases where uh, your final report is atypical um, because there were insufficient numbers of representative cells uh, or the uh, immunochemistry uh, was equivocal. So uh, again, uh, researchers have really, uh, you know, drilled down into the atypical category uh, uh, in serous fluids and they've uh, realized and demonstrated what we've known about the atypical category across other terminology systems, that it suffers from relatively poor inter-observer agreement. And that is probably the reason why, you know, perhaps those of us who are just starting out in our um, uh, careers uh, or, or not looking at a lot of samples of serious fusions might want to uh, lean on immunostains perhaps a little bit more than uh, experienced colleagues might. So there is a learning curve. I'm sure, you know, when I started out as a consultant, you know, um, 23 years ago, I was probably using immunostains a lot more than I do now. Uh, so, you know, there is um, a learning curve associated with the use of immunostains and the atypical or suspicious categories. Okay. Uh, so moving on to case number four of six, 
This is a 68 year old man with pleural fluid with a history of lung carcinoma. And macroscopically, we've received 30 mil of blood tinged fluid. And here in this collage, we see uh, some pap stained um, uh, cytos spin preparations. And there are just literally two cells here which appear larger than the surrounding lymphocytes and macrophages and mesothelial cells. And again, some other fields and at a slightly higher magnification, you spot these cells because you're hunting hard for small numbers of malignant cells and your suspicion has been aroused by the clinical history and also the finding of a couple of larger cells. And then again on the Gimza, uh, you find a small group of just three cells with irregular large nuclei. And you know, your suspicion is high now because there is a history, but the number of cells is small and you want to lean on immunochemistry to just confirm that these small numbers of cells are indeed malignant. So you might, on the morphology of the pap and Gimza, make a preliminary assessment of these cells are epithelial, but if I had more of them, I would call it malignant. So there is a quantitative factor. It's not a qualitative factor that these cells look bland and could be normal. No, these cells don't look normal. They look bad, uh, but there's not enough of them. And therefore, you're using the suspicious category and then confirming your suspicions by doing um, uh, immunostains. Uh, and then, therefore, uh, upgrading or revising your preliminary assessment from suspicious to malignant. So the scenarios in which the suspicious category is used is where there are small numbers of cells or groups with some nuclear pleomorphism and that require ancillary testing for the confirmation of malignancy. You may occasionally have cells with bland appearances or mild pleomorphism and they may even be numerous uh, or in small numbers or you may have mucinous material but with relatively few cells or no cells in the acidic fluid, such as in pseudomyxoma peritoni. Or you could have a lymphocytic effusion with a monotonous cell uh, population, particularly, say, in CLL or intermediate-grade lymphomas, not so much for high grades, which you'd be able to recognize. But you would still want to do some uh, ancillary workup to confirm uh, a lymphoma. So the uh, algorithm for the suspicious is similar to that of the atypical category, but with a fine difference in that um, uh, that the uh, you are dealing with a small number of cells on the cytospins that favor malignancy and epithelial malignancy or lymphoid or other malignancy. So your preliminary assessment is uh, that the findings are suspicious of uh, uh, malignancy and then you do immunostains to confirm malignancy. And again, in about 80 to 90% of the times, you will be correct and uh, you can sign out that report as a malignant. And again, it will be a small number of cases uh, where either there is insufficient representative uh, cells in the cell block or these uh, immunochemistry is equivocal where your final report may remain suspicious only and you request a further 75 mil sample to upgrade your diagnosis from suspicious to malignant. So bear in mind, of course, you've already had your talk on lung adenocarcinoma, so I'm not going to talk about this in any detail, but to just uh, remind you that serous fluid samples are a natural good medium for malignant cells to thrive in and they provide an excellent source of tumor cells for doing uh, ancillary studies whether it is mutation analysis whether it's rna studies um, and of course uh, immunochemistry uh, but with well, the word of warning here again as for eba samples is that you should be fairly selective and restrictive in your use of immunochemistry in fluid samples um, and keep it to a minimum of maybe just TTF1 and a P40, maybe napsin A if it was um, a TTF1 negative uh, lung adenocarcinoma, which you know 15 to 20% of these might be, because what you want to do is to conserve your material in a cell block for molecular testing, even when small numbers of malignant cells are, are present in an effusion. So, of course, you have the opportunity to go back and ask for more fluid, uh, but also you are being given a sample in its uh, natural medium for malignant cells where they thrive and multiply. And so if they get to the lab quickly, 
uh, you know, the sky's the limit uh, with what you can do with these samples. So to recap the uh, comparison, in between the atypical and suspicious categories. In the atypical category, you only have mild cytological abnormalities such as nuclear enlargement and hyperchromasia, uh, which presents usually as small numbers of dispersed cells and occasional small groups. Uh, you favor a benign cell lineage, but you want to exclude an epithelial or a malignant uh, lineage. And so your outcomes in immunochemistry might be benign in the majority of cases, and in a smaller proportion of cases, it will be suspicious or malignant or inconclusive. And the suggested risk of malignancy for this category is only to the tune of about 20%. Whereas in the suspicious for malignant category, you are starting out with a higher index of suspicion uh, of uh, malignancy, whether epithelial or lymphoid, and your outcome will usually be malignant. Uh, but only a small percentage of these will remain inconclusive, but with a risk of malignancy being to the tune of 80%. And if we can aim for an, you know, a 20-80 split in the risk of malignancy between these two categories, then it justifies the existence of these categories uh, <clears throat> so that there is little or no overlap in their usage. Okay, case number five. A 68-year-old man with a history of occupational exposure to asbestos, a unilateral hemorrhagic pleural effusion was received, 80 mil with a clot in the uh, specimen, which would have been processed automatically by the lab and examination of a combination of PAP and GIMSA. And uh, as you can probably guess from the history itself, this is a mesothelial uh, issue. The problem with mesothelial cells are they don't tell you whether they are benign or malignant. By looking at a mesothelial cell, you know, in all its glory, you know, bursting at the seams with, you know, look at me, I'm a mesothelial cell. You can't mistake me for an epithelial cell because I've got this two-tone staining of the cytoplasm. I've got this peripheral blebbing um, of, the, uh, uh, of the periphery. I've got submembranous glycogen vacuoles, very bland looking nucleus, uh, low NC ratio, can you tell whether I'm a benign reactive mesothelial cell or whether I'm a well-differentiated epithelial mesothelioma? And the answer is no, you can't. But by looking at the overall pattern of the effusion, if it is hypercellular and it is made up usually of equal sized morules of mesothelial cells, um, which show gaps or windows between them, and which have a single large eosinophilic cherry red uh, nucleolus, then these are features which are morphologically suspicious of mesothelioma. And all you need to do is confirm using a panel of immunostains the actual neoplastic nature of these cells. You shouldn't really be questioning yourself, mm, could these be um, adenocarcinoma cells? Because the morphology is telling you otherwise. Uh, however, the situation isn't always that simple, and of course, you may need to add TTF1 or, uh, uh, or an epithelial marker to, to uh, your mesothelial markers as well. So here we have, again, on the clot section, mesothelial cells with gaps or windows, large cherry red nucleoli, and a surrounding population of uh, lymphocytes macrophages. And this is the current sort of um, panel of immunostains that will help you resolve uh, the differences between mesothelial uh, proliferations as being either reactive or negative for malignancy versus mesothelioma. So with Desmin, you expect to see cytoplasmic positivity in reactive mesothelial cells, which is lost in mesothelioma. You can expect to see a thick membranous band-like positive staining uh, with, uh, with EMA in mesothelioma, but not with reactive mesothelial cells, where it will either be completely absent or only a very pencil-thin um, membranous staining. Whereas if you've got diffuse cytoplasmic staining with uh, EMA, then you're probably looking at an adenocarcinoma. But the defining immunostain uh, uh, really is your um, BAP1, 
which is a nuclear stain and nuclear stains in general are superior to cytoplasmic stains because they localize better. They su suffer less from uh, diffusion into the cytoplasm and into the uh, extracellular background. So nuclear stains are easier to read and interpret. And in you know 80 to 90% of mesotheliomas, the BAPT1 staining will be lost, whereas it will be retained in reactive and in normal mesothelial cells. Uh, but you know access to fish for either MTAP or P16, uh, which demonstrates a deletion, is confir confirmatory for mesothelioma. And that is, uh, you know, goes back to my statement at the start to say that uh, the diagnosis of mesothelioma can be made, uh, made on the basis of a cytological sample alone. Of course, always, always in the context of the clinical and radiological findings. And you're not saying you don't need a biopsy anymore. That still remains the gold standard. But if for any reason the patient isn't well enough to have a biopsy, uh, then a cytology sample with a good clot section and this panel being available would allow for the appropriate clinical management uh, for that patient. So there are some good recent reviews uh, looking at, at the cytology of uh, malignant pleural mesotheliomas and to say that, you know, this diagnosis is no longer now uh, the remit of histopathology. Uh, cytology, if done uh, appropriately and uses the correct ancillary tests, uh, has the capability of making the diagnosis of mesothelioma. So what are the different shades of gray in a mesothelial proliferation report? So, of course, you describe the uh, cell population. Usually these are small, spherical, uh, equal-sized, morular groups, a few dispersed mesothelial cells with only mild nuclear pleomorphism. You do your immunostains. If the immunostains are confirmatory, you can put it in the malignant primary category, but always, uh, you know, putting in the caveat that clinical and radiological correlation is essential uh, and that, you know, uh, the biopsy, uh, you know, would be would still be the gold standard. If the morphology is very, you know, suspicious and classic, but the immunostains are not confirmatory, step back from calling it mesothelioma. Leave it at suspicious for, malignant, for mesothelioma and defer to the pleural biopsy. And of course, if the findings are uh, not even strong enough on morphology and the immunostains are also equivocal, then you have to leave it at atypical mesothelial proliferation and advise further investigation. Okay. So the malignant category uh, should have a recognizable abnormal cell population uh, present and adequate for a robust diagnosis on which clinical management may be based. And the malignant cell type should be specified on the morphology alone or should be supported by immunochemistry. And based on this, the malignant category can be split into primary or secondary, which includes, as I said, the metastatic carcinomas, and then the non-carcinomas like, you know, lymphomas, melanomas, uh, lymphomas, uh, leukemias. Uh, and the primary organ site really uh, is relevant only for adenocarcinomas. So, you know, you may not be able to tell where a squamous cell carcinoma or a, a melanoma is coming from. Uh, the primary organ site can only be worked out for adenocarcinomas. So my final case uh, is that of a 45-year-old uh, female with ascites, 35 mil of blood-stained fluid. And on the PAP, we see, different to the population of the equal, even-sized morals of mesothelial cells with gaps in windows, here we have a variable-sized population of malignant cells. Some of them are really in large, spherical, tightly cohesive clusters. Um, of cells which show uh, cytoplasmic vacuolation, really coarse vacuolation, which indents and pushes the nucleus to the periphery. There is nuclear hyperchromasia, irregularity. The chromatin is very coarse, uh, and you get the nuclei being displaced to the periphery uh, of, of the cell almost in a hobnail fashion. And when you see these appearances, you know that you're dealing with uh, an adenocarcinoma, the cell size is, you know, five to 10 times larger than some of the lymphocytes and macrophages in the background, much larger than even the mesothelial cells, uh, which are present here at the periphery. But it's a tightly cohesive group 
with abundant vacuolated cytoplasm and nuclear pleomorphism. No two nuclei look identical, unlike that in mesothelial cells where on the routine stains, there is really very little pleomorphism. And uh, finally, once you, of course, get the cell block and your uh, h &E stain, you can appreciate the architecture much better with glandular formations and signet ring cells uh, in the background. And then you do your immunostain and whether this is a TTF1 or a CDX2 nuclear stain, you can confirm what your primary uh, site is. And so ascertaining the primary can, of course, uh, be, prim uh, be uh, uh, suggested or prompted uh, by the cytopathologist as the very first person. Uh, and the site-specific markers, this is an ever-changing list of immunostains. So, you know, in a few years' time, some of these will drop off the list, some new ones will get added on. Uh, at the moment, these are the commonly used, used ones, uh, but there are new ones coming up all of the time. And so you need to use a panel appropriately based on the clinical findings on the patient's gender and the uh, body cavity involved, whether it's the pleura or the abdomen. And so in a female patient, you will always remember to include breast as a positive, as a possible site, uh, or gynae uh, uh, as a possible site in, in abdominal effusions. Um, and uh, so, you know, your choice of panel should be small and limited, but guided by whatever clinical information is available to you. And a, a sample report would read thus, uh, the description which I've already, uh, you know, provided you on the previous slide, and then to say that immunostains will follow either on a supplementary report, or if you can turn these immunostains round, around in a day or two, then of course you can issue a report with the results of the uh, primary site. So my last couple of slides now to summarize uh, the diagnostic categories in the international system and their link to the clinical management. So based on your routine uh, stains and um, uh, the cell block, if it's non-diagnostic, you ask for a repeat sample. If it's negative for malignancy, of course, the patient will either be discharged or followed up clinically. If it is in the atypical or suspicious territory, then it requires ancillary workup and uh, so that most of the cases in the atypical category will probably be shifted to uh, benign, and most of the cases in the suspicious category will be moved into the malignant category. And in the malignant category, really, the reason for doing your immunostains is to establish the primary site or to pro perform prognostic and predictive marker. And so my final slide for the international system, the implied risk of malignancy, and this is thanks to the work of... Uh, uh, Dr. Farahani and Dr. Baloch, you know, this paper came out literally days before the book was to go in print. And I saw the paper and I literally went, stop press. We've got to have this article and this paper in the book because what it looked at was the risk of malignancy as has been reported in the last 50 years of uh, literature. And it sets an important baseline for us to work from. So this is not what I'm asking you to aim for, this is how things have been over the last 50 years in reporting cytology. We've had a risk of a malignancy of, of, of close to 20% in our non-diagnostic samples, no different to the negative uh, category, and surely that needs to improve. So if our non-diagnostic uh, samples are reduced in number uh, by uh, receiving uh, an appropriate volume of sample and well-preserved good quality samples, probably the risk of malignancy would be lower. Uh, similarly, there is a very small difference between the risk of malignancy between the atypical and suspicious categories. And we want to widen this gap between atypia and suspicious, bringing the atypical closer in its risk of malignancies to the negative. So we want to move move away from the historic risk of malignance of, you know, 66% to closer to 20 or 30%. And we want the risk of malignancy of uh, the suspicious category to move closer to 90% uh, to the malignant category uh, with the use of immunostain. So that is the sort of work that we are looking forward to coming out uh, of, uh, you know, your institutions. And I am so uh, privileged to be in touch with so many um, bright, Pakistani 
uh, pathologists, you know, obviously looking up to your leaders, both practicing in your country and abroad uh, and following their model and being so active out there in the field of presentation and publication and through sharing your cases on social media. Uh, and I'm really very proud indeed uh, to be connected to you all. I thank you so much for your attention 